Good evening, everyone. It's Sarah Tonin. I was actually looking up, um, seeing if I could find the actual um, story of the leader. I believe it was a Middle Eastern leader who refused to allow anyone visiting him to wear green because he thought that green was the devil's color. And uh, I came across foods that royals can't eat, and I found it very interesting. Anyway, it's right here. And two of the first things that they can, <laughs> can't can eat, apparently, is rare meat or raw meat and garlic and onions. And so I'll just let that sit with you. I thought that was quite funny. Anyway, um, I wonder why, right? So I wanted to uh, also, just on this very interesting thing here, I found this. Um, about French and Nigerian tradition about the devil's colors comparative study of French and Nigerian folktales really random you might think but so fascinating um, and what I wanted to uh, highlight in here is just some of the interesting things they wrote so um, there's a, a really interesting um, part here about what they said were uh, the five primary colors. The five primary colors were red, red yellow, green, blue, and violet. Um, and by 1728, um, he had added another two, which were orange and indigo. So apparently the primary colors are basically the rainbow. Um, and um, retained apparently only four of them in 1952, which were blue, green, yellow, and red. And um, I found it really, really interesting that um, in here we have some descriptions for both um, Nigerian and French um, oral traditions of descriptions of the devil. Super interesting. So let me see if I can find it. I know I was just looking at it before and then I decided to like have a little look up and down here. Supernatural encounters. We will first look at the texts in order to summarize the data and highlight their variety and ambivalence, meeting a number of characters in the process. The most prominent supernatural being encountered in France, whatever the region, is the devil. Storytellers from Riotier, the Upper Alps, variously describe the devil as a young man dressed in a monk's black frock or as a black man with red lips and protruding eyes. And what was really interesting, I was reading my children this evening, a very old <clears throat> book, um, children's book from, I don't even know, I got it from like a secondhand bookshop quite a long time ago. And um, it was, there was a depiction of a doll in it, which was basically a doll that looked like it had black face on it and was exactly that had very red lips and protruding eyes very very bright eyes and back in the day um that used to be called a gollywog and for those people who used to live in england um bassett's licorice all sorts which is a, a candy had this particular thing as its spokes uh or spokes not spokesperson but um uh, the the emblem for it. I can't think of the word. I'm having one of those moments. But anyway, um, so interesting. Okay, so either as a uh, young man dressed in a monk's black frock, or as a black man with red lips and protruding eyes, or as a handsome Caucasian male dressed partly in white and partly in red, or as a red-haired man that lives in the thick of the forest or up a mountain that can be black, red, or green, usually green in southern France and black in the northern parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> very interesting. So I found the handsome Caucasian male dressed partly in white and partly in red. Very interesting given the time of year we are in right now. It made me think, of course, of Santa Claus, St. Nicholas. Um, although the devil is most and often associated with black, a huge black man in a folktale collected in 1896, he likes other colors as well, appearing dressed in green or in a red coat or as a little red man springing out of the hearth flames who later turns into a young lord clad in blue. A legend from Besson, um, published in the Almanac du Petit Dauphinois in 1936, mentions a red demon who disappears in the green sulfur-smelling flame. In this variant, 
This creature is wrapped in a black mantle, just as frescoes from the Besson church represent the devil as yellow and black in the midst of red flames. Oral tradition from both France and Nigeria records encounters with other supernatural beings and details their appearance. So they talk about fairies or fays who are women dressed in white. The ghosts of the dead are either wrapped in a white shroud or in black linen. In Brittany, dwarfs carry huge deformed heads over stunted black bodies. The Narovs of the Jura legend, wild malevolent beings, are stocky and black-faced and run barefoot covered in rags. Another evil being the bogeyman, who is invisible except for his hand, and a black or green in Dauphinois tales drags children into the torrents, wells, and abysses. And there are reports about yellow, green, and blue-horned demons. In Igboland, white is traditionally, I've never heard of that, associated with ancestral spirits. Very interesting. Testified by G.T. Basden's photo of an Igbo initiate ceremonial body painting with one side painted white, the combination representing him being half man, half spirit. Many of the spirits are associated with animals of the same color as they take their form or appear in their company or require them as sacrifices. Such spirits include black or white snakes and cats of all color. According to a legend from Saint Maurice de Val, Val Godemar, but mostly black as noted in the Dauphiné folk tales, where the devil manifests himself as a black dog or cat with black cats or black chickens used as sacrifices to carry him. Attract him, sorry. Folk tales that may also display a series of white animals, horses that carry their rider into a flowing river, pigeons and doves that help the hero. Um and chamois glim glimpsed by a dying hunter beauty darkness and light in the widespread igbo folktale of Enendu, ogres who decide to kill their adolescent vi visitors smear his face with white chalk and that of their own child with gray ashes the aim is to enhance the color of the fair one whose fairness is, is red as a threat in order to facilitate his nighttime capture the undo clears chalk off his face and smears it with ash instead. This will result in his his being spared. Interesting. This is interesting. Another folk tale, the orphan's body colors enhanced by the water spirit smearing it with indigo. Indigo children, anyone? Widely used before the introduction of modern cosmetics, indigo dye confirms black as a color of, of beauty. While the bright darkness of the skin clearly marks the girl as human as she has moved into the spirit world for a dancing contest. The Bible records that the devil can masquerade as an angel of light, and Newton's experiments led him to recognize the relationship between color and light. Brilliance is what set colors apart while giving them a religious polarity. In Igboland, masquerades and mermaid dances commonly associated with white employ many mirrors stuck on brightly colored cloth. In the that's like sequins, right? Think about all the clothes in the 70s, the sequins clothes. In the Igbo language, shining does not necessarily mean that one is fair in complexion. It is more accurately associated with beauty, more precisely, a beauty that oozes out of the skin and owes little to no color. And it would therefore seem that folktales are more or less told in shades of black or white with French folktales, including traditional references to red, green, blue, and yellow, all associated with the supernatural and endowed with an ambivalent polarity that can be measured on the following double scale, usually, but not always, read from positive left to the negative right. So interesting. I'm going to leave a link to this very fascinating essay in the description box below. But I don't want to get lost in this because this is fantastic and I really, this is incredible. What I did want to talk about though here is this. I decided to just go ahead and read, basically I went through this entire margin here with the exception of the introduction. I had a look at every single page over here. I had a look at this one here, ceilings, and this one here, right here, the parallels. Um, they also caught my eye, the garments and temple clothes. First of all, I just want to say that if you are interested at all in the yellow rose for texas videos um at all i would highly recommend you read this i asked her a question um on one of her most recent videos and said um that i had read this i told her that i had read this and left a link and said you know what do you think of all of this because there seems to be a lot of confirmation here 
But what I will say, what really freaked me out, I've never even heard of this before, but I decided to Google this part, the garments. Um, I've never even heard of that before. I didn't know anything. I know nothing about this group of people, this, this religion whatsoever. If I will just repeat myself though here, if you, uh, do have a look at this whole piece here, I believe there is so much being said and one of the most in, in sort of, uh, so what I want to say, um, insightful pieces here is this whole thing on creation, um, where apparently they talk about creation room. Now I realize they're actually describing, um, a ritual here, a ceremony. Um, but, uh, I think there's a lot more truth than most people realize, um, in all of this description stuff. And I want just to note that here it's written quite clearly, um, that the Elohim are in charge of this entire thing with the creation. And it is Jehovah and Michael that are sent down to actually apparently create the world in seven days. It's not at all as we've been told if you have been given religion um, or teachings from any other thing this is totally different um, so it says here for example Elohim says Jehovah and Michael see yonder is matter unorganized go ye down and organize it into a world un un like unto the worlds that we have here for to formed so you guys Jehovah and Michael you go down and create a world like the ones we've made before Call your labors the first day and bring me word. It shall be done, Elohim. Come, Michael, let us go down. Right at the end, ba 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 ba. So they do all this. Right at the end, you know, fifth day, sixth day, the whole bet, the whole bet, guys. It describes the the creation of the earth and the whole thing. Then they go back, and basically what happens here is Elohim says, Jehovah, see the earth that we have formed. Oh, first of all, Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael enter the creation room. Michael sits in a chair with his head on his uh, chest, his eyes closed as if he were lifeless. Jehovah, see that the earth that we have formed, there is no man to till and take care of it. Here we, here are, sorry, we are here to form man in our own likeness and our own image. We will do so. Elohim and Jehovah pass their hands in the air over Michael's body from head to foot. Elohim says, Jehovah, man is now organized and we will put him, put into him his spirit and the breath of life that he may become a living soul. They uh, lift Michael's head into an upright position and his eyes become open. Then Elohim says, Jehovah, is it good for man to be alone? No, it, sorry, it is not good for man to be alone. We will cause a deep sleep to come upon this man whom we have formed and we will take from his side a rib from which we will form a woman and to be a companion and help meet for him. Elohim and Jehovah lower Michael's head to his chest again. He closes his eyes as if asleep. Brethren and sisters, this is Michael. Okay, so they're talking to the crowd watching this ceremony or whatever uh who helped listen to this this is michael who helped form the earth when he awakens from his sleep which we have caused to come upon him he will be known as adam and having forgotten all he will become as a little child brethren close your eyes as if you're asleep and so they do blah 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 adam awake and arise all the breath all the brethren will please arise adam here's a woman from whom we have formed and whom we give to you to be a companion and help meet for you. What will you call her, Eve? Why will you call her Eve? Because she's the mother of all things. That is right. She's the mother of all living. Um, Adam, we have organized for you this earth and have planted a garden eastward in Eden. We will place you in the garden and there, and will there command you and Eve to multiply and replenish the earth so you may have joy and uh, rejoicing in your posterity. Jehovah introduced Adam into the garden for which we have prepared for him. It shall be done. What? So, very interesting. So, apparently, the story is that Jehovah and Michael created the earth um, under the um, command of the Elohim. And then they turn Michael into Adam. And it's really interesting because if you know the story of St. Michael, St. Michael was the one who slayed the dragon. And there's a whole thing here in the telestial world and the terrestrial world. And it even talks about the veil. The whole thing is all supposed to be symbolism and ceremony. But, dudes, I don't know. I'm just, there's so much going on in here. I even looked up telestial world. I'm like, what is telestial world? And, of course, 
there is no meaning outside of LDS, but I found it very interesting that there's also telestial in Hindi. It says, unsaved Gentiles spent eternity in the lowest plane of heaven, the telestial kingdom. Bum, bum, bum. I found that really interesting. I really wasn't interested in finding out the meaning of Telestial in LDS. It was basically the lowest plane of heaven. I thought it was so interesting that it's a something that is a word in Hindi as well. So, going back to this, what are the garments in temple clothes, you may ask? Well, I had a look at that. And garments in temple clothes are literally underwear that you wear to church for ritual. And what's so interesting is here, each one that you wear has a marking, just like these people here, these smiling humans. It has a right angle over the right side of the body, a compass. It actually says a compass. If you read in here, it will explain to you what it all means. Actually, no, it doesn't. I think it explains in, oh, I don't even remember. Masonic parallels, perhaps? I can't remember exactly where it, it it's one of these pages. I'm not going to get into it right now. You'll find it if you if you want to. If you don't, then you won't. Um, this navel marking, and then down over the knee here, and apparently this is like so that you can always find your way, whatever. This is to show the, the relationship between the mind and the body. Don't get it. And this is to remind you to always kneel before God and then this is someone shaking the hand that is representative of God through the veil it reminded me of um, something else um, people who uh, if you live in the city and you, you know a little bit about um, the gay culture um, this is possibly what people refer to as it reminded me of what people refer to as a glory hole which is basically where people have um, anonymous sex uh, through a hole in a cloth, um, apparently. So, yeah. Anyway, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here um, about this, these garments. Um, I don't even know what is going on here. Like, what is this supposed to be? This is, wow. Okay, tell me that this is not sexual. This is so creepy. This is, I don't know. Someone's saying, tell me this, this can't be real. I just, I don't even know what to say about all this. Holy crow, guys. I feel like I've fallen down a rabbit hole that won't stop falling. This is apparently what garments look like and um yeah this is you looking really chaste and going to church i'm sorry okay it's like a mix of hypersexual mixed with like modest uh it's just it's really creepy to me that you would belong to a religion that that makes you wear specific underwear to church i think that is so messed up uh, and, you know, as I said, I was raised Catholic, um, and there's a lot of messed up stuff going on in the Catholic Church. So, yeah, um, and apparently, oh, here we go. And these are the marks. Left breast mark, right breast mark, and navel mark. And it's all done with very fine stitching. And this is what you wear to church. And you've got your apron. And just, I just, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, I'm speechless. I'm just speechless about the whole thing. There's the creation room. There's your temple dress. That's your apron. Those are your garments. That's your robe and your veil. Everything is see-through. Even the underwear.
I don't know, man. I don't know what to say about any of this. Anyway. Mind blown. Mind freaking blown. Anyway, okay, I'm done here. Um... Wow. Temple garment is a type of underwear worn by a vast majority of Latter-day Saints Mormons after they have taken part in an endowment ceremony. Garments are bo worn both day and night. Wow. And are required for any previously endowed adult to enter a Mormon temple. The LDS Church claims that temple garments, which when properly worn, provides protection against temptation and evil. In Mormon folklore, tales are told of Latter-day Saints who credit their temple garments in helping them survive car wrecks, fires, and natural disaster. And it goes... Mormon underwear, magic Mormon underwear, superstition knickers. Wow. Okay. And so interesting. Oh my gosh. I just, I can't even look at that. So creepy. Um, this is, I found very interesting. Okay. So, former LDS member. Okay. I see so many wrong answers, covers ups, and sidestepping on this question. So let me give you the truth and the direct answer. The Mormon underwear, or magic underwear as some call it, is an undergarment given to temple-worthy members of the LDS religion. They're worn during the secret Masonic ritual that takes place in the Mormon temple, or known as protective garments, and are taught that they can protect the member from harm and evil. However, belief in protective clothing comes from the occult world and is very big in witchcraft, for example. Mormons trust in cloth for protection, while Christians trust in Jesus Christ. On the garments are small markings which are Masonic. The same markings also exist on the garments worn during the Wicca ceremonies and in the same places. Why? Because not only the markings but the ceremony itself comes directly from the world of the occult. Witchcraft, Satanism, and other various occult and pagan religions also use Masonic symbols along with other things borrowed from Masonry. Masonry itself is Luciferian, basically Satanism with a fancy name. You asked about what rituals are related to the garments? So I have provided a transcript of the death penalty oaths sworn by all during the ceremony. This transcript, however, is from long ago and the ceremony has since been toned down a lot and some wording changed and removed. The reason is because at one point there was a sudden push to appear more Christian in order to gain converts. Also because many were leaving the religion due to the disturbing nature of the ceremony. Early penalty for the first token of the Aaronic priesthood. We and each of us covenant and promise that we will not reveal any of the secrets not sacred of this. The first token of the Aaronic priesthood with its accompanying name, sign or penalty. We agreed that our throats be cut from ear to ear and our tongues be torn out by their roots. Holy crow, people. guys what the heck anyway that's all i have to say about that Whew. talk to you soon for now a farewell have a good night